Oh, Stephen, the book is called Me and the Table. Does it sum up just how much the sport has meant to you throughout your life? Um, yeah, very much so. Um, I came up with the title because basically through my whole whole life, uh, whatever was happening away from the table, I, you know, I always was happiest, and you know, when it was just me and the table, just just potting balls. Uh, even now, I, I don't play a lot. Um, certainly don't practice like I used to, but um, when I'm just a little room table, just potting balls, making breaks, clearing up, it's, it's kind of like my, my sort of happy place. You say a happy place, was it almost an obsession? Oh, very much so, very much so. That My whole, you know, my obsession in the beginning was just playing snooker, getting better, trying to be like my idols, like Jimmy White and Steve Davis and that thing, you know, obsessed with copying them, being able to play their shots. Um, and then when I turned professional, my obsession with, with winning and uh, trying to, you know, overtake Steve Davis's records, that became an obsession. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I went into it, you know, 100%. What can we say? 104. Absolutely incredible. Hold your breath. This is it. Yes. Fantastic performance. I've never seen anything like it in all my career. You dominated the sport in the 90s. Did you feel invincible at times? Very much so. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I was number one in the world for eight years in the spin. I, I won the world championship five years. On the spin, um, you know, I almost took winning there for granted. Um, you know, one 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 year, I remember um, saying to my wife, "You know, can you pack pack that jacket for me? I want to wear that for the fight after for, after after party, after the <laughs> final." You know, I hadn't even gone down and played played the first round yet. You were that confident. I was that confident. Um, you know, but it was like um, even now, you know, people say to me, "You know, where's your pipe and slippers underneath the table <laughs> at the crucible?" It's like, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, even now I think it's my venue. Even now, and I'm, I'm just working there. You know, commentating and stuff, but even now I think this is where I belong. Wow. We'll, we'll get to the commentary uh, later uh, in the interview, but let's go back a bit. Uh, you got your first snooker table at the age of 12. Mm. You made your first century break at the age of 13. You were really taking to the sport very early, yeah. but it was to the detriment of your school studies, that's right? Oh, uh, very much so. I, not, in, not in the very beginning, but certainly um, when I got to sort of 14, 15, um, you know, homework went out the window. Uh, and fortunately for me, my parents didn't really say, right, no snooker, you've got to do your schoolwork. Um, I think early on they seen it as, as something that I was going to do um, for the rest of my life. And, and also, from the age of 13, I was, I was earning money. You know, I, got, <laughs> I think I won the, my first under-16 tournament, I got 100 quid, which at 13 was just like, uh, amazing. Um, I gave 50 quid to my mum to put in a bank account and I, and I bought a watch with other 50. So that was, uh, that was me starting sort of looking after myself. Um, but yes, yeah, school, you know, I left school, you know, a few months earlier than I should have, because basically it was a waste of time. Did you feel you were developing that business brain at even such an early age? Um, maybe not a business brain, certainly a spending brain. I learned, <laughs> I learned that very quickly. Um, yeah, it was nice to have money in your pocket. I learned that very quickly. Um, but as I say, I, you know, I virtually supported myself from then on. Bought my, you know, buying clothes for myself, and um, it, it, it was great. You know, if you'd win a pro am uh, snooker tournament, you'd get maybe fifteen hundred quid in, in your in your pocket, and it's just like this is great. You're talking about the balance here between school and practicing. Uh, in terms of the, how significant your parents were, uh, you played in a number of. Uh, amateur events throughout the UK. You touch upon that in your book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. I'm, I'm, you know, my dad and I would 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 get in a train sometimes on a Friday night down to Kings Cross. There'd be a, a some pro am in Essex. Um, invariably, in the beginning, I would go. I'd get beaten the first round, straight back to Kings Cross again, and the train back. It was so it was it was tough, but it's that was that was how you learned. You had to play these guys. You had to get streetwise. Um, in, 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 in snooker and, and uh, it certainly hardened me up and, and, and toughened my game. His ambition is to win the World Championship, his ambition is to become number one and honestly I don't see anything to stop him. I guess one man that perhaps helped you become streetwise was Ian Doyle. Mm. Um, at the age of 16 I think you turned professional, uh, Ian Doyle took you on. Just. Uh, how big an influence was he on your career? I, I, Ian was, was is definitely the biggest influence in, in, in you know in, in my life. Um, he turned he turned my sort of life upside down. Um, even just after I turned professional, I was still in a club in Broxburn, um, sort of having a game with my mates, having a bit of a laugh, not really treating it as, as treating it professionally. Um, he, he he came on a secret sort of recce and, and just to see what I was up to. Um, 
and and from then on he says look if I'm going to look after you and if I'm going to take you know take care of everything else off the table you know finance your career you're going to work for me son that was his thing you're going to work um, so then I went I left Broxburn went to Stirling and from then started a regime of sort of six and seven hours a day seven days a week um, and you know that that was the influence that, that sort of changed my life um, but then it was just it was good because it was like it was like Ian and I against the world sort of thing against the regime it was Steve Davis and Barry Heron was was the team that was dominating snooker and we wanted to to, to take over from that hmm. was he quite a formidable guy and you seen he caught you out there and mm. you're saying that was probably the best thing that could have happened to you oh without a doubt I mean if, if I didn't um, you know my, my dad although he, he, had, he had my dad had massive faith in me that, that I would win world the be world champion even not practicing whether that would would happen I, I, I don't know but um, yeah that that work ethic that Ian really drummed into me was certainly one of the secrets of my success. Hmm. So he became the sport's most um, successful player ever, but you didn't enjoy that massive popularity or popular appeal like some other players, like uh, Alex Higgins or Jimmy White. Did that ever bother you? No, no, never. Why not? <laughs> I, I just, I, I like winning too much. Um, <laughs> and I sort of took over from Steve Davis as the sort of... Uh, the, the, I w hated is maybe a, a strong word, but certainly the one that the, the, the fans, you, you know... As you say, Jimmy White and Alex Higgins were the favourites, yeah. um, and I'd go out and play Jimmy White in the final, of the World Championship, the Crucible, and, and he'd have 80, 90 percent of the support. Um, but I, I, I used to really spur me on. I, I, I liked that. I liked being, um, as I say, the hated one, the one that had to, you know, prove everyone wrong. In your book, uh, you refer to your single mindedness in an incident with uh, John Higgins when he won the championship mm. in uh, 1998. Tell us what exactly happened there. Um, yeah, I, 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 John Higgins won, won his first world title, and, and I, I, I used to practice with John a lot. Um, in Stirling, he used to be managed by Ian, um, and then he made a decision to, to, to leave the team, which I thought was the right decision. You know, he was always going to be number two to me, uh, and, and I respected him that he wanted to be his own man. But um, we were still great friends, and he won the World Championship, and, and I, I didn't call him to, to congratulate him. Because basically, that was mine. And if anyone else won it, even if it was my brother won it, I would be like, I'd, you know, I'd hate it. So that was just my... You know, looking back, it, it, it's 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 harsh, but that was just my selfishness, and and I wanted to win any, anything and, and everything, and and if someone else won the world championship, I hated it. Um, you know, I obviously rectified it later and and stuff, but um, yeah, probably a bit over the top, but that was just me. But if you didn't have that single mindedness back then, you would believe you weren't wouldn't be as successful as you'd become. Yeah, absolutely. That that was me. I just I, I was you know so greedy for success. I wanted to win everything, um, and if anyone else. Uh, especially the world championship, that that was the crucible. Winning the crucible was everything, um, and if anyone else won there, I, I didn't like it at all. How much do you think you shaped snooker? Uh, I think I, I think I changed the way it was played. Um, I think uh, you know the way it's played by the majority of players now. The the aggressiveness of um, getting the pack open early, you know, win the frame in one visit as soon as possible. Um, you know, tr not safety. You know, no safety play. Um, or very little safety play, yeah. just just going for everything. Um, even if it was the craziest shot ever, if I went for it and missed it, it didn't matter because my opponent would think next day, well, if he's going to go for that, he's going to go for everything. My safety better be perfect, you know. So you put them on the back foot, and and that's the way, um, you know. I think I changed the game. My, my break building was was more aggressive. Um, so yeah, it was. Um, you look and look at the players that are playing now. Um, that, that's the way snooker's played by most of the players, certainly the top players. And you're talking about the aggressive style of your, your play. How important was it that you got that message across to your opponent mentally to make them weaker? Yeah, as I say, you know, you've got to put them on the back foot. You've got to, you know, players that are, that base, you know, then base their game on, on sort of safety play, forcing the mistake out of you. If, if you know, it put more pressure on their safety play. They, um, you know, they just wouldn't know what you were going to do next because basically I'd, the slightest sight of a pot I'd go for it um, so yeah it, it just the thing well, what's you know this is not the way snooker is supposed to be played um, even Willie Thorne said once that professionals shouldn't go for the shots that I go for um, so yeah I, I changed it so you retired in 2012 when your game um, turned for the worse after it was affected by the yips mm. what happened there um, yeah basically sort of the last 10 12 years of my career 12 years before the end um, certain shots I would play that, that I, I wasn't able to play strike the cue ball the way I wanted to. Um, I would decelerate on shots instead of accelerating through the cue. So I thought, well, that's, that didn't feel nice. Um, I don't like that, how that felt. 
um, but you kind of sort of ignore it. And then, then it would happen again, and you think, there's definitely something wrong here. Um, you know, it's a psychological thing that transmits to being a physical thing, you know, with your right arm, your cooing arm. Um, and then it just got more and more shots as, as my career went, went on. Um, you know, again, obviously it's a psychological thing and perhaps, you know, you know, not winning as much and slides going down the rankings a little bit affects everything. But um, in the end, it got to the stage where I, I was refusing shots, um, which isn't me. Uh, as we just said, I want to go for everything. Um, positionally, I was playing the wrong shot because I was playing shots to avoid playing shots that I knew I couldn't play properly. So yeah, I mean, in the end, Matt, I was I was completely handicapped by this in, in, in playing top snooker. Away from the game, you've had uh, issues to deal with um, in your private life, um, such as the breakup of your your marriage. Uh, how difficult was it to write about that in this book? Very difficult, very difficult, and I, and I, and, I, and I thought long and hard of it uh, whether I should. Um, but basically, the, the idea of the book when I started it was just to tell the story of my life. Basically, um, that's what I wanted to do, and and uh, and that's what hopefully um, has, has come out. Yeah, I'm looking forward to watching the, this match tonight, especially Kyron Wilson. He's had a he's been one of the form players this season. Since you retired uh, from playing professionally, you've turned to the commentary box. Mm -hmm. Have you found that transition? Um, I enjoy it a lot. Uh, it's not as as good as playing. Um, you know, when you're in the, in the crucible, the, the final night of the final. You don't want to be in that auditorium with a microphone in your hand. You want to be in there with a cue playing. So well, you already I, had your jacket lined up before you played. <laughs> I know. So I'll, I'll always miss that. I'll always miss being in, uh, you know, in, in in the pit as it were, playing, you know, top competitive snooker. I'll, I'll always miss that. Um, but you know, talking about it uh, and commentating it is, is is a second best. I'm still involved. I mean, snooker is basically all I know. So I can't play, at least I can talk about it. Stephen, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thanks very much for speaking to you. You're very Scott welcome. Tonight. Cheers, thank you. Cheers.